My name is Poku Andrew Forsen. I am the head of quantitative analytics and risk for Empower, and I lead the Empower quantitative analytics and risk unit. I have an MBA. Uh, my background is in finance and accounting and information technology. I have advanced studies in financial and risk engineering. I have worked as a trust and estate practitioner and have a diploma in international trust management and ICSA, which is now the Chartered Institute of Governance Certificate in Offshore Financial Administration, a certificate from the Association of Certified Anti-Money Laundering Specialists, and a variety of accounting and finance qualifications. Uh, for many years, I have worked for a range of firms, ranging from Deloitte and Touche, the consulting side, to Emergo uh, in my latest iteration in the crypto and Web3 space. My role with Empower is basically to define the details of the financial products that hew to the goals and objectives of the white paper. In terms of myself, I am born in Canada, Montreal, uh, to two West African parents from Ghana, West Africa, uh, physicians, raised in Canada, and am currently living in the Costa del Sol, Spain, near Gibraltar, near Malaga. I am of, though I'm born in Canada, my parents are from Ghana, West Africa. So the Empower mission of facilitating access to finance and capital for the development of affordable housing is near and dear to my heart. Um, I think one of the critical things that people sometimes don't appreciate about Africa is one of the fundamental problems that they have on the continent is access to capital. It's not that capital is not there. The continent is actually quite wealthy in terms of natural resources, uh, in terms of weather, in terms of culture and people. But they have difficulties in accessing the sort of capital, money, infrastructural tooling that we have access to um, as somebody who is living in the UK, Gibraltar, Spain, or in my case, Canada. Um, wealthier countries basically are able to allocate capital to their citizenry in invisible ways. It can be via roads, the education system, healthcare. In many African countries, the governments don't efficiently allocate the capital. So the people are often starting at a disadvantage. What really struck a chord with me with the entire Empower philosophy and project was that they seem to have understood that in Africa, and I understand Africa is a diverse continent, many countries, many different cultures, so I may be making some generalizations, but for the purposes of this exploration, we're pretty much referring to Sub-Saharan Africa. But in Africa, one of the most important investments that any individual or family wants to make is in their property in their property and their home. They tend to purchase their properties and their homes with cash. And sometimes that cash comes from relatives living in the diaspora. They have to do this because the financial institutions do not have a good way of quantifying the credit of many of the individuals who have income from informal sources. Effectively, the individuals are self-employed. And for most of us, if we live in a, if we're watching this as a citizen or a resident of a developed country, 
you'll know that if you are self-employed, your access to credit, for instance, goes through a somewhat more complex process than somebody who is employed by the government or employed by a large business. This has to do with the reliability of cash flows. Somebody who is an employee has very, very predictable cash flows. In Africa, many people are self-employed and earn their revenue through an informal sector. So their cash flows are not predictable. Because their cash flows are not predictable, financial institutions are reluctant to extend the credit needed to make the larger investment in property and assets like real estate. That's one of the issues that is faced. The idea of how do you quantify and formalize the revenues generated through the informal sector, as in somebody who may have a very effective street vending business selling beverages at a street corner, but they're not going to have uh, an end of year income tax slip. So this is one thing that needs to be dealt with. The other thing that needs to be dealt with is underlying volatility in terms of exchange rates. Uh, Africa has many, many countries. Uh, there's a lot of political instability. And with political instability, you tend to have incidences of financial instability. What I loved about the Empower project was the idea that we could leverage Web3 decentralized technologies, blockchain, to, in a word, bypass some of these traditional hurdles in order to formalize the informal revenue sector and thereby potentially give access to capital to millions of people, which would then enable us to allow 1 million, 2 million, 3 million, 4 million, 5 million plus homes to be financed and built on the continent. Now, traditionally, development finance institutions have looked at the affordable housing specter on, sector excuse me, on the, in the continent as somewhat of a loss leader. But what really struck me with the concept that Glenn and Phil, the CEO and CTO and co-founders of Empower put forward, was the idea of using market mechanisms to solve this problem. The more I learned about the fact that the objective is to use market mechanisms to solve this problem, I was sold. So then where do I come in? Well, in the crypto community, we understand very much the benefits of decentralization and the technology to perhaps usher in a new era of democratization of finance, capital access, and the capacity for the individual to effectively manage their own assets and transactions. But the crypto community is not yet mature enough and stable enough to have access to the deep capital pools that traditional finance community has. Now, from my perspective, some of the problems innate to the crypto community actually could be solved if we took time to learn more about how the traditional financial services community does its thing. The second thing to consider is that if we want to be successful in achieving our mission, then we have to be willing to, as Bonnie and Clyde said, go to where the money's at. We have to be willing to go to the banks and the traditional financial institutions to access their pools of capital to help us achieve the vision of providing financing for developing these homes. So, it's very, very simple. We have our vision of financing affordable homes in Africa, and then we understand where the deepest pools of capital reside. The question is, how do we make that linkage between the two? 
to use technology parlance, what sort of API could we use to connect the traditional financial institutional world with the affordable housing requirements in West Africa using these new technological instruments that we have at our disposal at our disposal now. This is where our unit comes in, in terms of taking a look at the white paper, in terms of taking a look at the white paper and trying to turn the objectives of the white paper into a financial language that our partners in the world of finance would be able to understand, be able to value, be able to measure the risk, and be willing to invest in. Now that process required a significant reevaluation of not only the elements of the white paper of the white paper, but also how Web3 technologies and the world of traditional finance can work together. It's not something that could be done overnight. We had to do a lot of research. It actually took a lot of time. And it also required us looking at those elements of the world of finance that are non-negotiable, i.e. we have to understand the role of cost of capital. We have to understand the role of risk. But it also requires an understanding of what's happening on the ground on the continent of Africa. For one, securing assets in many African countries, uh, probably other than perhaps many North African countries in South Africa, securing assets is an entirely different process. There are tribal considerations. Of course, the recording of income is entirely a different process. Uh, the sources of income are a different process. Somehow we had to find a way of connecting those two. So in the process of defining what we felt was needed, the black paper was born. Now the idea behind the black paper is to have a written single source of a library of financial terms and tooling that is relevant to the Empower platform. Uh, the actual subtitle of the Empower Black Paper is the Mathematics, Financial and Risk Engineering Underpinning the Empower Ecosystem of Financial and Utility Instruments. Why is this process important? Because in order to attract capital, we have to be willing to demonstrate that we've taken the steps needed to understand the valuation of the EMP token, to mitigate risk, to measure risk, and also to enable our counterparties, particularly on the institutional side, to value the instruments that they have. What does all of that do? Well, if we provide all of those things, it gives them the ability to trade. It also means that we potentially can have more liquid instruments. If we have liquidity, then risk is reduced because it means you can move in and out of positions quickly. If we are able to establish all of those things, then it follows that we will be able to attract capital into our core mission, which is the affordable housing sector in many African countries. If we can achieve this using market mechanisms and it can be done in such a way that our counterparties and participants are able to earn positive return, that would be revolutionary in its own right. In its own right, there would be significant benefits. The beauty is we've done it, we can do it more, and the fact that we are able to leverage Web3 technology and blockchain to create single sources of truth and record informal payments in a consistent, demonstrable way gives us the tooling that we need to be able to give confidence to investor participants 
in the instruments that the Impala platform is going to issue. So that was the first step. And now we need to explore what does this mean and how do we do it.